Welcome to As the Story Grows, I'm Brian Patton. Today we welcome Visions of Atlantis vocalist Mikal Guaitali. Visions of Atlantis released Pirates 2 Armada back on July 5th with Napalm Records. If you're subscribed to the newsletter, you will have read about my recent power slash symphonic metal fandom and discovering a love for a new genre of music. Armada is a phenomenal record, one of my favorites of the year so far. My daughter loves it. So I highly recommend giving it a spin if you haven't yet. Mikhail talks about the music scene in Italy, how he joined Visions of Atlantis, the birth of the Pirates era, creating more than just an album, and so much more. It was a delight to chat with Mikhail, and I hope everyone enjoys this episode. Thanks so much for checking out this episode of As the Story Grows. If you're new to the show, welcome. Thanks for listening. If you aren't subscribed to the podcast, I would love it if you subscribed on your podcast platform of choice. You can find links to our Discord server, to the mailing list on Substack, or to our Patreon page where you get early access to every episode of the podcast. You can also leave a comment and I will read it on air. I just checked out comments on Spotify. My bad. We have two from Timmy Reed. The first is on my episode about Caspian's You Are the Conductor. Timmy said, I love Caspian. So happy to see you do the older stuff that doesn't get the recognition. And then on chapter 500 with Chris from like Moths to Flame, Timmy said, why would you start an interview with My Wife Hates Your Band? Timmy, great question. Honestly, I thought it was a fun, funny, lighthearted icebreaker, and that's why I led that interview with that comment. Just something to connect me and Chris right off the bat. If it was weird, you know, not trying to offend Chris. I don't think he took it that way. Just a fun icebreaker. And that's why I started that interview the way I did. Leave a comment. I will read your comment on the podcast, just like I read Timmy's. I'm going to be better about checking Spotify, I promise. Let's get into my conversation with Mikel from Visions of Atlantis. How are you doing? Good. How are you? I'm fine. I'm excited. Busy. Busy. Yeah. Really, really busy. It's yeah. busy days, as you can imagine. Yeah. 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 The, the press tour, it's, it's constant. <laughs> Correct. Correct. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Well, I'm happy to have you here. New record's great. Um, and, and I'm not like traditionally a symphonic or, or pirate metal person so <laughs> good that's even better <laughs> yeah right like <laughs> yeah you know I'm, I'm definitely way more into death metal but like you know in doing this podcast and you had to talk to bands again to just hear a lot of bands like you get to discover new stuff and so it's been fun listening to the new record which is great and then going back into the band's discography and being like oh this is delightful <laughs> okay that's fantastic great thank you <laughs> yeah. uh you are uh you're in austria uh actually i'm the italian of the crew okay <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean the band is from austria but i mean i'm the italian Act to be really really honest yeah. where i live we joke and we say this is south austria yeah because <laughs> i'm like an hour and a half from austria i'm like okay. exactly close to the border so that's also why the connection started and everything so yeah. it's <laughs> yeah but still in italy still in italy yeah yeah the band is so like you know I mean, there's been so many member changes over, you know, the band's career that it's really an international band at this point, not just, you know, an Austrian band. <laughs> no, 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 absolutely. But the good thing is that uh, now the, the lineup is stable since six, seven years. This is the, yeah. the, one, the next one will be the seventh year. And uh, this also brought uh, stability and mm -hmm. quality. I think yeah. it truly reflects, at least from our perspective, we truly see that now that we are stable and nothing is changing anymore, there is, especially in the last year, there's been a massive growth thanks to the fact that we are, uh, we have found this balance that was completely yeah. lacking before, you know? So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Nice. Where in Italy uh, did you grow up? It's called Udine. 
Uh, the only reason why you might know about my city is because of the soccer team, Udinese, which is okay. in the A League. If someone knows the city, it's because of that. I'm pretty close to Venice. Okay. One, right. and, one and a half hours to Venice, which is right. definitely more known. <laughs> nice. 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 What was growing up like? What, what can I say? It's, it's <laughs> uh, cr- crazy days. And yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what got you into music? Um, so long story short, my mother subscribed me to a piano course when I was six. And this is when I started to understand about music, uh, started to learn how to play. And that gave me a vision, you know, that gave me a a vision of, you know, musical sense and everything also because it was a professional course. So I had to study theory and, you know, all the music course and everything else. Mm -hmm. Um, but when I was like 14, 13, I was like, okay, this sucks. I don't want to do classic <laughs> music. <laughs> I really, I really am not into that. Uh, yeah. I love guitars. Uh, I want to try guitars. So I, I bought my first guitar. My, my mother was furious. Like she, she was like, no electric guitars, rock music, no Satan. Hey, go <laughs> step, step back. Uh, but in the end that, that truly, you know, found a way in, inside my heart. Yeah. And since, since then I, I, yeah, I never stopped listening and playing and, here I am right now with a musical career. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks God, thanks God, my mom uh, subscribed me to a, a yeah. piano course when I, when I was a kid. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, what was it? Uh, was there like a band or something that made you swing to guitar? Um, oh, the Offspring, actually. Okay. I think that you, you know back then um, it was the X9 on the Ombre and Americana uh, mm-hmm. period, and they were on MTV. Remember back then oh, there yeah. was this, uh, this, it was completely different. And when you were watching <laughs> videos on TV, like you could be truly amazed by, by what was going on. Videos were not yeah. that popular. Only big bands could afford making videos and ha- having the videos on MTV was like something. Wow. Yeah. Super, you know? And I remember that the, I think it was the kids are not right. You know, this video with, uh, them spinning in the center yeah. of the room and, and, and changing. And I was like, okay, I need to learn this. I need to yeah. learn how to do this. And th- yeah, that's why I started crazy. If you think of it, a punk rock band and I'm a heavy symphonic metal head now. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What was the music scene like, uh, whether in Venice or in your town, like, was there a music scene? Yeah. Back then, back then it was pretty strong back then, especially, especially the metal and the punk metal scene was pretty strong. And I, I had quite some friends in my school that were like dressing up with, you know, leather jackets and everything. And I was like, Hey, that's, that's cool. Uh, what, where are you hanging tonight or stuff like this? And they were like, well, there is a concert here. There is a concert there. There is a concert over there. It was pretty popular, uh, like pretty popular to go out on the weekends and attend some shows in small pubs, small yeah. venues, nothing big. We never had a big, big venue no. except for the stadium, like the Udine stadium hosted Metallica, Muse, uh, Bruce Priesting, all the big names, yeah. you know, but in general, we were like venues. It was venues between 200, 250, uh, cap, you know? Nice. Um, and yeah, you, you went there for a beer and at the same time you were, watching the show and yeah hanging out with other other people like you then of course time changes uh, constantly and right now i'm afraid that we basically don't even have one of these venues left you know oh, because man. of it's it's insane it's insane we never had a very good club you know like if you think of uh i don't know the oriental theater in denver or i don't know the whiskey in in los angeles you know if you think of this of these venues we never had something like that it was always somehow more uh what's the word for this more uh homemade in a way you yeah. know it was yeah, it was DIY, a room yeah. yeah diy a room yeah. that the owner turned into a venue you know yeah. so in the in, in the long term in, it never truly worked and or sometimes it was pubs pubs that stopped doing live music because of cost because of the space because of mm-hmm. the of, of these or these other reasons there are some there are still some pubs where yeah. where where you can listen to local bands but it's me- mostly you know deep purple cover bands or iron maiden cover band or rammstein cover band you know something that is definitely more trending than uh, original uh heavy metal music yeah yeah one of the things i'm fascinated in talking to people around the globe is just how different countries treat kind of 
artists and musicians and i think you're the first italian i've ever spoken with so uh well, oh. how, how does italy view and treat like musicians in the music scene is it supportive or is it more like i don't know in the states where it's kind of the middle no. finger to creative people <laughs> there is there is support there is absolutely okay. support but uh it's more oriented to uh popular music you know okay. it's more let's say that when you or rap rap is extremely trending here yeah rap music hip-hop trap uh, hip uh, like you know all the gen z uh st yeah. <laughs> style of music <laughs> This is way more popular right now. I think that metalheads and rock and rockers, they always had a harder time to get the same support that yeah. uh, more, more popular music. But I, I don't know if this is the same in, in the US right now, but for sure here, they don't look at you in the same way. If you dress in black and you know, <laughs> you, you look like a, a, a metalhead. And yeah. <laughs> throughout my entire life, uh, it was never, never, never uh, comparable to the enthusiasm that you get if you if you are a pop artist or a pop, yeah. you know, drummer, guitar player, or whatever. Yeah. But <laughs> true to be told, rock festivals and heavy metal festival festivals they are the most populated here. Yeah. Like when yeah. yeah when there is a music festival you know around the corner even if it's a small DIY festival you will have a lot of people over there. Nice. Which is good. That's awesome. At what point did you start trying to form bands and, you know, make it as a musician? So when I was a teen, 18, uh, I had started my very first original music band mm -hmm. and I started to have the first tours, the first shows outside of Italy and everything. But back then I was a, um, a lifeguard. I, this is the okay. right, you know, like the, the one in the swimming pool that yeah. looks yeah. over. Yeah. The lifeguard, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, so, it, it basically was my hobby being a musician was my hobby it was my <laughs> dream but i couldn't make money out, out of it you know yeah. <laughs> then it kind of turned the moment in which people started to ask me if i could give singing lessons okay. because it started like a second hobby mm -hmm. and then a music school wanted me in they hired me and i started to split the hours between the swimming pool and the music school then the music school took over and i became somehow a full-time musician even if musician even if i was teaching partly yeah. and partly playing then another music school hired me and i was like splitting the hours between udine and goritz another city close uh, in the in the surroundings and at a certain point when i was like 30 i i think it was around 30 live shows started to take over the teaching and yeah. yeah right right now i wouldn't have the time to do anything else than than, than performing live because yeah. it's so demanding and i'm last year i played 115 shows or so yeah. which <laughs> if you think the traveling days yeah. the touring days the days off it basically means that one day out of two i was on the road so yeah. <laughs> it's pretty crazy not, it's it's insane it's insane it's good yeah, yeah. <laughs> especially when you think i think there's a lot of bands that have taken a scaled back approach to touring more recent years so like yeah that bands are still like grinding like that is like impressive <laughs> yeah yeah the thing is that we started to tour the u.s mm -hmm. this was a game changer for us yeah because as a european band entering the u.s market is not something that you can take for granted yeah it's absolutely not something you can take for granted in 2022 we toured with dragon force we had this massive tour with dragon force and people started to put eyes on us and we had the chance to come back in february 2023 in september 2023 in february 2024 we are planning 2020 and basically this adds up to all the touring schedule that you already have in europe because it's mm -hmm. normal for us to tour in europe we started to regularly tour in the us and this is like two months a year in which you are away from home because once yeah. you are there you know how vast yeah. <laughs> the united states are so yeah. you, you don't just play the east coast or the west coast you know yeah. once you are there and you have working visa you want to exploit them because they are fucking expensive man yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> so you're like okay it's 52 states let's try to hit as many as we can <laughs> right right yeah
Let's jump ahead then. How do you end up in Visions of Atlantis? So, previous singer was called Siegfried Summer. Mm -hmm. um, in 2018, Visions of Atlantis became a demanding band on the live schedule. Mm -hmm. It was like, back then, I think 40 to 50 shows per year. Uh, not as many as we do now, but it was already quite some. And he has a day job. Uh, so he found himself with a choice of either giving up and getting into Visions of Atlantis or keeping the job and yeah, not risking it. And he made a life choice. He decided to stay in, 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 hof in his office. He has another band, but of course the, the schedule is not the same. It's called Dragony. Um, and they do power metal, uh, like pretty fun power metal with, a uh, with, a yeah gimmick approach to the Austrian <laughs> history actually it's 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 fun uh, it's a fun band but uh, of course like the, their life schedule is way um, way uh, less demanding compared to yeah. visions of atlantis so he was looking for a, a, an option and he himself called me because we knew each other because visions of atlantis uh, were touring in europe in september 2018 and my other band called Temperance was the opening act. Yeah. And it was like, well, this guy know how to sing. Let's see and if he's interested in joining Visions. And it, I was. <laughs> so, <laughs> so there I am. <laughs> uh, that's awesome. How much uh, of the lyrical work do you do for the band? Uh, I am the main songwriter now. Okay. I, I had to earn this place. Yeah. I had to earn this spot. Because, of course, when I joined in 2018, I was the last arrived yeah and people were like okay let's be careful we had so many lineup changes right. let's freaking be careful you know so and it, to me it felt like i was singing covers because basically it was the new singer i was singing original songs yeah but to me i, I was not in the studio i was not in the songwriting it, it, it really felt different compared to what it is now absolutely different but then we started getting along with each other. We started trusting each other, which, you know, it's, it's a bit different when you are 25, 30 compared to when you are 15. And right. when you are 15, you just give trust to people because, you know, you don't know how the world works. Right. When, you, when you are 30, you're a bit more skeptical, you know, like you get a new, uh, I don't know, a new partner at, at, at your job. You don't give him the key of the office immediately, you know, like, right. hey, let's let's go step by step and this this happened with me and visions of atlantis so wanderers the record we recorded in 2020 had two songs that i wrote okay pirates had six songs that i wrote and the enthusiasm around the, the my songwriting grew especially the, on the fans which is the most important thing you know yeah and we ended up with my songs being chosen as singles for the, for pirates most of them except for melancholy angel um because fans were enthusiastic towards them and they they really liked them so at, at a certain point we were like okay like should we try and see what happens if I write the full album? And this is what happened with, uh, with Armada. Nice. So uh, my, my role right now, it's, it's, it's pretty strong. Clementine, she writes all the lyrics, all the lyrics. And Thomas is basically the one in charge of the management of the band. Mm -hmm. Plus you have like, right now we have roles, Herbert and Christian, the guitar player and the bass player. They are the hands, the, you know, like the operatives, I would say. <laughs> so you have the songwriter, you have the lyric writer and the universe creator, because Clemmy also creates all the universe and the stories yeah. around, uh, around what we do. And then you have like Tom managing and Christian and Herbert being the operative guys. So we, we found a, a great balance. I have to say. That's awesome. Did you have to kind of learn a different approach to whether it was writing symphonic metal or like when you come to pirates writing, like, thematically i think i think we can say that i adapted uh, okay. for sure for sure um like i come from progressive metal and power metal mm -hmm. so mm, my previous bands when when in, in the bands in which i was writing from the beginning even the bands that i founded because there are a couple of bands in my past that i founded myself you know so these bands were definitely a bit more uh, heavy i would say compared to visions and also more technical oriented you know uh, i think that if if the evolution of that band would have gone further uh, in time if we didn't split probably right now i would have a gent band or something like this you know, a bit more a bit more uh yeah technique oriented yeah, but more like <laughs> 
Yeah, or lepers. I, I think lepers is, is my like my hundred percent cup of tea nowadays. Periphery <laughs> lepers, this this kind of stuff. Uh, so not so extreme. Still with melodies, you know. Melodies yeah. is, is uh, big. Melodies are still part of my yeah. of my musical approach. But yeah, um, with visions, um, of course, you have to respect the nature of the band in which you you end up and i i like symphonic metal because i'm a big fan of nightwish i'm a big fan of the old with Temptation, a big fan of you know many of the uh, avantasia camelot which even yeah. if are male fronted they are still uh, symphonic metal bands uh, so it's not like it's a style that was absolutely far from my from my universe so mm. i i adapted i have to simplify i have to uh deorient stuff from the technique towards the orchestras because of course symphonic metal is orchestra oriented but yeah i i adapted pretty well i would say <laughs> <laughs> you guys release wanderers and then you know the pandemic hits how what was the band's approach to that and was this kind of pirates theme born out of just having time to create and think during the pandemic no, the pirate team was there already, uh, except that it was not so explicit. Because uh, the Deep in the Dark, uh, we have pirates in the videos and several songs that are about, uh, you know, the pirate universe and everything. And even <laughs> Wonders, Wonders is a, a, a bit uh, like mm, the concept around Wonder is like there is a shipwreck. And the people that survive from the shipwrecks wander in search of their self. Of course, this is a metaphor of our own research of our own selves. Mm -hmm. So there is always a deeper meaning behind the entire stories that we are, that we are telling. But, um, wander still was uh, an ocean related, a pirate related, uh, um, album, except that it was more about the wandering rather than what happens on the ship itself. Uh, then, at a certain point, we were like, guys, we are flirting with this so much. Why don't we <laughs> just go all in without, yeah. you know, being like, okay, we are pirates, but we don't want to show we are pirates. It <laughs> was like, and, and, and we did the right choice, you know, because in the end, you know, I don't know how much you are into Marvel movies or uh, into books. And you, you, but you know, when you create a universe, you create a religion, yeah. you create something that is trustworthy because who would believe that someone gets pissed and become big and green and, and you know, like you <laughs> hope, or who would believe that, you know, you have someone coming from another planet that is Superman and, or, or, you know, like gets beaten by a spider and becomes Spider-Man <laughs> and, and stuff like that. You know, so, yeah, I mean, Superman is DC, but that's a different topic. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. So when you create a universe, you really yeah. take people into that universe and the messages that you give are people are more open to receive messages mm -hmm. to detach from the universe of every day to the world of every day to you know your tasks your job everything that you have to do so we told each other let's do this i am sure we are all sure that the moment in which we start dressing up as pirates and we are consistent in the presentation people will understand that this universe is meant to take you away from reality to make you dream for an hour of the record two hours of the show and in this hour you can truly enjoy what's going on without thinking of the fact that yeah you have an office to go to tomorrow or you know <laughs> that your daughter or your son has an issue at school and so on you know so and it worked it worked really well nice nice with pirates you did pirates over Wacken and a pirate symphony what led to those decisions to kind of expand that record and give it you know more life pirates over Wacken. uh it, the choice was done just because Bakken was a freaking amazing experience. Like we, we had so much excitement going on. We were like so emotional on that, on that day. And I think you can feel it in the record. Mm -hmm. When we listened to the recording, like the pure recording without editing, we were like, okay, we need to publish this. And the label was like, okay, of course, you are giving us a record without any expense. Let's do it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you know? yeah. So there is no reason why a label should say no to a live album if the band yeah. presents it and gives it away basically for free to the label, you know? Yeah. So they were, they were absolutely enthusiastic uh, of the, of the idea, but I think it, it's, it's a record that holds and brings to the, to the listener a really strong emotion, a really strong emotion. Um, Pirate Symphony instead, this was basically a request of those who follow us. 
uh, we had a lot of fans that were like, hey, we would love to listen to the orchestra on their own. We would love to listen to the songs without the electric guitars to understand what's going on. Because in the end, we are a symphonic metal band and the orchestra is a massive role, a yeah. massive role. Um, so we decided to do it, but I don't know if you're aware of this. It's a limited edition. Like, uh, it's yeah. not like we printed it uh, in infinite copies that will always yeah. be online. It was like 500 uh, CDs, if I'm right, or a thousand CDs and 300 vinyls. And that's it. So, uh, it was a really small, uh, press meant to satisfy those who were asking for it. This new album that's out, Pirates 2, when you wrote the original, did you always know there was going to be this sequel record or did that kind of, was Armada birthed out of just like, I don't know, the no, we, we, we were absolutely not uh, thinking of Pirates 2 back then. It yeah. was like, we, we, yeah, yeah, I don't know, absolutely. The thing is that, um, so Pirates has 12 songs and we consider this 12 novels about Pirates. It's 12 story. It's not a concept album, you know, but it's 12 stories in the pirate universe. As if you get a book and in this book, instead of having a story that begins for the first page and ends in the last one, you have just uh, 12 different stories in the same context. Just imagine, I don't know, Black Mirror, the series on Netflix. Yeah. It's the same concept, but it's 12 different stories. It's anachronistic. This is the right word, right? Uh, I, I think it's like something that doesn't, uh, doesn't end and begin in the same concept, but it's yeah. like, just, just different stories. When we finished writing Pirates 2, we ended up with 12 more songs and Clementine write the lyrics and she was like, well, the thing is that these are 12 more stories. It's different stories, but it's 12 stories. So why not creating the concept of, you know, a collection of books, a collection of CDs? Pirates 1, 12 stories. Pirates 2, 12 more stories. Let's see if there will be a Pirates 3 or if she will come up with you know, a concept album or something different. I, I, I cannot say right now if there will be Pirate 3, but for sure, if there will be 12 more stories, 12 more songs with different vibe, different style, and so on, there is a good chance that it will be Pirate 3. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Because you've had this, like, you know, constant lineup for the last, you know, what did you say, eight years now? Or six years, six yeah, years. Six, six years. years. Mm -hmm. Did that make the writing and recording of this record easier or more comprehensive like could you notice like okay we're all moving in the same direction now better yeah absolutely absolutely even even the songwriting is easier because now especially playing so much live we are getting to know each other we are getting to understand how one works how one plays because you know music is not is not something that is objective. Music is yeah. really subjective, you know, and one guitar player can be a great guitar player, but maybe he is not good in doing, you know, bluesy stuff. And the other guitar player may be an amazing guitar player, but he's more into rhythm rather than solos and, you know, so on. A great singer can have one approach to singing, but maybe, you know, for, if you, if you have a powerful voice, it's one thing. If you have a, delicate voice you have to highlight the delicate voice and it works mm -hmm. as well as the other side the, as the powerful singer but you have to write different things you know and i think that getting to know each other made the songwriting easier because we know how to highlight our powerpoints and how to avoid what we're not good at mm -hmm. because there are things <laughs> which we're not good at obviously um <laughs> And then this reflected in a simpler and way easier studio work because it was like, okay, this is written for me. It's, it suits me. It's easy to play. It's easy to sing. So yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. i has been out just a few days now, about half a week. How's the reception been so far? For now, it's amazing. I don't know <laughs> if this is because the bad reviews will arrive later, <laughs> but for now, for now, I have to say we are. It, it's going better than we expect, and uh, we, are, we are we are following the charts right now. And you know, like uh, we are getting quite some impressive numbers, at least 
considering our expectations now we're yeah. we're a pretty humble band we don't expect to be you know number one or number two in you know number one in the german charts it's going to be difficult but the yeah. trend is good and uh, on itunes we are actually number one in the heavy metal section in pretty pretty some quite some quite some um, some countries or for instance we topped six uh, on Amazon and iTunes in Germany, we topped uh, 15 in France. So these numbers are relevant. <laughs> you know, yeah. it starts to be it starts to be interesting. So let's see where this takes us. I'm positively surprised. I I have to say, yeah. which is always good. Yeah, it seems like my I don't know. Maybe maybe it's not a universal experience, but like coming out of the pandemic, it seems like there are more people open to a wider variety of genres of music, even within metal. People who maybe not wouldn't have given symphonic metal a shot before myself now yeah, yeah. are listening to a band like Visions and like, you know, there's a bigger tent that people are welcoming more bands in. I think that the pandemic gave time to people. Mm -hmm. That's the only upside of the pandemic. No. Because you were stuck to be home and you knew that you couldn't do much in the following day. So people relaxed. Yeah. People sat down and they were like, okay, let's take a breath and let's see what the universe has to offer me. And I think it worked. Yeah, I think it's really worked because people, I feel like people is more open-minded after the pandemic. Yeah, There are some topics that maybe should have stayed closed but this is <laughs> not a <laughs> not a you know some people dig dig too much into things that maybe people should have not digged into but yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh yeah for sure uh band has uh some european dates uh, throughout the summer into september is that all the touring you guys are doing for the rest of this year or is there something on the horizon that is no no, no, no. we are yeah, yeah, there, there is quite some stuff that is unannounced. We are finalizing the next US tour. As I said, once, once we start, uh, once we started, we, we're, we're never going to stop now. <laughs> Since it, it, the US is, we found El Dorado to say, uh, uh, <laughs> to say it in a pirate way. Like the US truly really embraced us. I yeah. think that there is, there was already back then more open mindedness, open mindedness towards cosplay bands because mm -hmm. we are a cosplay band yeah. i think that you are more used to theater shows to the musicals and everything and uh, this is somehow exciting and maybe in europe there it still needs some time yeah. we are finding we're we're growing now but in the us like people were truly excited to see people dress up as pirates and telling pirate stories into music yeah. it was like wow you know like everyone was so enthusiastic and once you know like we found this enthusiasm there is absolutely no reason to skip it even if the visa costs are increased as you perfectly know i think yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> but we we are we're not giving up like we will we will always come back and we are planning the next us tour now actually uh, i think it's going to be april 2025. Okay. Uh, so right now there is um europe until october then after that there will be uh us and at the same time we are playing also something else but you know it's I, I don't want to. It, no, I'm, a yeah. <laughs> I'm a bit scaromantic. I'm a bit scaromantic. Let's see if when it happens, it will be out on our social pages and on our website. So. Oh. Well, the thing is that as I hope it's it's clear, like we are not only doing music, we are truly creating a universe. You know, yeah. if you read the lyrics, if you watch the videos, if you look at the pictures, we truly want to be consistent. We truly want to take people out of reality, put them inside this pirate movie that has a wonderful music, a wonderful soundtrack, but also an entire visual. So if this is something that might click into you. you you might click something into you might ignite something we are the right band for you that's what i want to say <laughs>